This is the sitting rising test. You sit down crisscross applesauce and you stand back up without using your hands or legs. Developed in 2012, it's supposed to be a measure of longevity, supposedly. So let's try it and if you're in a space where you can do it with me, then feel free to do it. Okay, I'll put the microphone down. Okay, let's try. Uh, you cross your legs and then, fuck, I'm gonna knock away the street. <laughs> And I can't get up from here. <laughs> okay. Well, while we're down here, I kind of want to get into the disclaimer of today's video. If you're just kind of a cold hard facts kind of person and you just want the science, feel free to skip ahead. Now, I'm obviously a big guy and I have a BMI of 38, which is just below the highest level of obesity you can get to. So when I talk about fitness, obesity and health, these are things that are really important to me. In part one of the series, we looked at the globetrotting history of obesity. And if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. But by the end there, I kind of glossed over a lot of the modern conversations surrounding obesity in a not so respectful and diligent manner. So if any of you felt like you had your opinions ignored or just kind of hand waved away, I apologize. I try to do my best making these videos and I never intend to do harm, but clearly by the end, I missed the mark. This is going to be a comprehensive attempt at addressing fat activist talking points. And I use the term fat activist very meaningfully. While there is a lot of good in the way the medical world has changed the conversation regarding obesity, the political fat activist kind of cultural movement has done a lot of harm and has spread a lot of lies about the realities of being an obese person like me. If you have any reservations, traumas, or triggers surrounding obesity, disordered eating, you know, health, fitness, all this kind of stuff, then I leave it up to you whether you want to watch this video or not. You know, if you feel like you're not at the right place to consume this kind of content, feel free not to watch. But there are a lot of lies out in the cultural zeitgeist regarding obesity. So if you feel like you can watch this, I highly, highly recommend that you do. And as for the rest of you, well, we're about to have a very sobering conversation about obesity. Let's get started with the first lie. Obesity isn't that bad for you. Didn't you hear? Obese and overweight people actually live longer than normal weight people. Now we all know obesity is associated with terrible things like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, certain type of cancers, and so on. This isn't controversial. What fat activists argue, however, is that correlation does not equal causation and that instead of being caused by obesity, these things are caused by a mix of unhealthy behaviors and discrimination. It's the greasy, salty, sugary diets, lack of exercise, and the stress from fat phobia that causes health problems, not that obesity itself. One often cited example is the obesity paradox. Studies have found that contrary to everything we know about obesity, when it comes to the elderly and people suffering from diseases, the risks of dying are worse if you're at a normal weight and you're much better off being overweight or even slightly obese. Which on the face of it is completely counterintuitive. How can fatness, a supposed cause of diseases, keep you healthier if you get those diseases? Commentators have been quick to draw up conclusions about fat keeping you healthy if you get sick. But instead of this being a question of biology, it's really more about the data and how you slice it. Another paradox that could help us understand is the so-called smokers paradox, which shows that smokers have better survival rates following heart attacks than non-smokers. Should you start slamming a carton of cigarettes every day? Not just yet. Smokers are, on average, 10 years younger when they do get heart attacks. But even adjusting the data for age doesn't fully make the paradox go away. That's why it's called a paradox. This is a classic issue with epidemiological research. It's the reason why one week coffee causes cancer and then the next it's actually a healthy superfood. Studies like this observe trends in data. They're not clinical trials where scientists conduct experiments and observe outcomes. And a lot of the time, when these observations are tested in clinical trials, scientists can't prove that they're real, with some researchers who test the validity of nutritional epidemiology finding that 80% of them are just not real. They're real as in they're real in the data, but they can't be replicated in real life. So next time you're reading a headline about a food you love being bad for you or having anti-aging properties or whatever else, 
click on the study and see what kind of research it is. Chances are it's an epidemiological study, and if it is, just keep that 80% failure rate in mind. So already we're off to a very rough start. But that's not enough to disprove the research. Good epidemiology does exist. You just have to try your best to reduce the bias and the variables. A 2017 study on over 200,000 men and women found that when you adjusted the numbers to account for disease-induced weight loss, the paradox basically disappeared. If someone was obese, got an obesity-related disease, and then lost a bunch of weight, and then died, they'd be counted against the normal weight category, even though they were suffering from the consequences of being obese. If you adjusted the data to take into account someone's maximum weight over the past, you know, 15 to 16 years, then you got a much clearer picture. Obese and overweight people and people who were formerly obese and overweight clearly have the highest rates of mortality. Poof, paradox gone. But this is only one explanation out of many. Some studies attribute the paradox to selection bias, others attribute it to doctors potentially giving larger patients better care over normal weight people when it comes specifically to stuff like heart disease, where they know the bigger you are, the more at risk you are, or like in the smoker's paradox, overweight people being younger when they get these diseases and living longer with the disease compared to normal weight people who are likely to have already lived a long, healthy life and are older when they get sick. Catherine Flegel, I'm sorry if I mispronounced the name, is one of the researchers who popularized the idea of the obesity paradox, and whose research is often cited by fat activists. And she has a great write-up on all the potential causes of the paradox that will be linked, along with all my other sources, in the description. But the story doesn't end there, because it's not just disease survival rates. According to some research, all risk mortality, not just in sick people, follows that same U-shaped curve, meaning overweight and slightly obese people live longer than normal weight people. Does a little chub keep you healthier longer? Well. Let's go back to Catherine Flegel, the one who popularized this type of research. In a 2017 study meant to address the criticisms of her previous work, she implemented several restrictions meant to mitigate the potential biases of the paradox. Subjects were excluded if they had conditions that could lead to rapid weight loss. Smokers were excluded because they tend to be extremely unhealthy skinny people and any deaths that occurred during the first five years were discounted as they could have been caused by prior conditions. We were measuring purely healthy groups of people here. With these restrictions, the differences in mortality between overweight and normal weight people disappeared, with overweight people being 2% more likely to die earlier, a statistically insignificant finding. Obese people remained with higher risks of early death. Despite this, the obesity paradox lie has been particularly insidious. In a recent episode of Citations Needed, a podcast that focuses on critical analysis of media and that I've literally have never heard a bad take on, recently had a guest who promoted this lie in an episode of Fat Phobia in Media. For instance, I don't know if you followed the story of Catherine Flagel, that there seems to be like that really the worst health effects are on the on either end of this. So either if you're very thin or you're very fat. Yeah. But this middle category of even obese is just kind of neutral. I don't know. I mean, it's just not that big a deal. And that overweight category is actually seems to have a startling better health effects for people. Fat phobia is a very important cultural issue that we need to address and will address in this video. But in the podcast, you can see how addressing fat phobia can quickly become being overweight slash obese is actually good for you, dangerously quickly. I doubt the podcast hosts are very well versed in like nutritional science, so I don't blame them. But when these ideas get platformed uncritically, they start entering mainstream thought and get accepted without being challenged, despite the science not supporting it. Moving on, we have the next slide. You can be healthy and obese. Metabolically healthy obesity exists and it's a condition where, despite being obese, other biomarkers from blood work will come out totally normal and healthy. Some people who have MHO don't even have insulin resistance, which was long thought to be impossible. How could this be? Firstly, there's very little scientific consensus about what metabolic healthiness even is. Depending on how strict you measure it, it ranges from up to 50% of obese people are metabolically healthy to just 5%. 
But regardless of how you slice it, it's clear that not every person with obesity is the same and there are very real differences in the levels of metabolic unhealthiness from person to person. So while more research needs to be done and a clear definition of what metabolically healthy means, one thing from the research is clear. Metabolically healthy obesity is transient. In a 2013 study, one third of the MHO participants became metabolically unhealthy over the course of the study. And in a 2015 study, over half of the MHO patients became metabolically unhealthy. The risk of becoming ill was eight times higher than that of the healthy group with normal weight. Those who maintained their MHO status tended to be younger, under 40, meaning there was less time for the consequences of obesity to fully take effect. Let's go back to the smoking comparison. Like with obesity, the consequences of smoking can take years to develop. But because smoking over time does increase your risk of stuff like cardiovascular disease so dramatically, the shoe will drop for smokers at one point or another, just like it does for people with obesity, even the healthiest ones. Okay. But what if it's not obesity itself that makes you unhealthy, but the pressures of diet culture? Some scientists, like Dr. Paul Ernsberger, argue that yo-yo dieting is the real culprit behind the health issues. He argues that people with obesity are more likely to go through big fluctuations in weight because they're constantly told they need to lose weight by dieting. They'll diet, lose weight, and eventually fail and regain it, which is a pattern of behavior associated with the exact same negative outcomes as obesity. Several studies have shown that weight cycling is correlated with an increased risk of all-cause mortality. But in a 2012 review of these studies, researchers found that they often didn't account for unintentional weight loss. You know, the thing that happens when you have a serious disease that can often be caused by obesity? When you disregard unintentional weight loss and focus on people that intentionally dieted, weight cycling was either inversely associated with mortality, so you're actually less likely to die, or there's no correlation to be found, meaning yo-yo dieters weren't any worse off because of their weight cycling. In another study, rats who fluctuated in weight had outcomes more similar to rats who stayed at a healthy weight than rats who remained obese their entire lives. That's not to say this is exactly settled science here. There's still a lot of scientific literature that shows the opposite of the studies I just mentioned. And these studies correlate yo-yo dieting with various cancers and diseases. Moreover, if you struggle with yo-yo dieting, it could be that you suffer with an unhealthy relationship with food or mental health issues that by itself can cause a lot of these problems. So even though we don't have a clear answer to this, it's clear to me that yo-yo dieting isn't the end of the world if you've done it. Most smokers quit seven times before they actually give up smoking, and I think with dieting, it's kind of a similar thing. With each failure, you slowly learn what works and what doesn't, which is a knowledge that can help you actually stick to a plan that leads to long-term weight loss. The fact that people are stuck in endless yo-yo diets is an indictment on modern diet culture, but we'll get to the efficacy of dieting later. For now, we're here to disprove that obesity by itself isn't bad for you. People who are obese might be worse off overall, but health outcomes are determined by more than just your weight. We need to isolate obesity as a variable and prove that it alone is bad for you. This is, unsurprisingly, very difficult to study. You can't take two groups of healthy normal weight people, force one into becoming obese, and see what happens. Good luck getting that through an ethics panel. But we can do our best to isolate the variables as best we can. In a 2013 meta-analysis of eight studies, metabolically healthy obese individuals, so the fittest of the fat, were compared against metabolically healthy normal weight individuals, so the fittest of the fit. Results showed MHO participants were still at an increased risk for all-cause mortality and heart-related issues compared to metabolically healthy normal weight individuals, suggesting that the increased weight on its own was enough to trigger negative outcomes. Another older study from 1988 studied a group of men who were instructed to lose weight. The first group reduced their food intake, but not the nature of their diets, while the second group did not reduce their food intake, instead focusing on exercise to lose weight. By the end of the study, you would think that, according to the fat activist line, it would be the second group who changed their lifestyles and began to exercise that would see greater benefits not the ones who just lost weight through simple caloric restriction and nothing else. But that wasn't the case. 
Both groups saw similar amounts of weight loss and saw similar improvements to their blood test results, suggesting, again, that it's not just lifestyle that leads to poor health, but that weight itself plays a major role. We can also look at overweight athletes to see how they fare health-wise. Athletes of all sports tend to live longer than non-athletes, so it logically would follow that overweight linemen and sumo wrestlers would reap the same benefits, right? Well, no. According to CDC, football players with a BMI over 30 were twice as likely to die from a heart attack, and the heaviest linemen died 25 years earlier when compared to the average population. Sumo wrestlers similarly have significantly reduced life expectancy and it gets worse as their BMI gets higher, suggesting that not even exercise and cardiovascular fitness, the biggest defenses against the consequences of obesity, can completely shield us from its effects. And to further make the point, a number of diseases see both small and dramatic improvements if the patient loses weight. To name a few, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, certain cancers, sleep apnea, joint problems, reproductive issues, asthma, gallbladder problems, incontinence, depression, thrombosis, stroke, and gout all fall under this category. Some research even suggests that obesity can affect the aging process and hurt our cognitive functioning. It might seem like I'm pushing the point a little too hard because for anyone who isn't a fat activist, this is kind of obvious. Increased adiposity puts incredible strain on the body. And fat isn't just some inactive energy store. The fat in our body plays such an important role in our functioning that it's considered another organ in our body, just like our heart or our lungs. And stretching that organ to its limits is quite obviously not good. I want to be clear that having obesity isn't an automatic death sentence. In terms of consequences, something like smoking is way worse for you, but it's not a benign condition. And even though I support body acceptance to a point, we shouldn't lie to people either. So if you've been paying attention, one key takeaway here is that nutrition science is hard, complicated, and confusing. There's all kinds of conflicting reports and studies that it's hard to separate fact from fiction. And as we saw with the obesity paradox, small biases can create bombshell headlines that fuel an entire movement. I also want to be clear that this is just one perspective on the science. There are many more very informed people that disagree with my stance entirely. While I do believe that the overwhelming consensus is that yes, obesity is bad for you in any condition, there are some people that disagree, and you can go search for those voices if you need to. But I think a big part of this division has a lot to do with ideology, because the importance that you place on our weight determines how we deal with it. Both historically and presently, doctors have focused on lifestyle interventions, caloric restrictions, and surgical procedures to reduce patients' weight. This weight-centric approach has focused primarily on reducing BMI, BMI being used as a proxy for health. A lot of fat activists take issue with this, saying BMI isn't a good measure for health. It can't distinguish fat from muscle. Even Arnold Schwarzenegger is considered obese by BMI. Which is true. In two out of every five cases, BMI is actually wrong. But not in the way you'd think. BMI is actually more likely to underestimate your body fat. According to a study in 2012, if you took 100 men and 100 women, only three of those men would be muscular enough to fall under the wrong BMI category, and zero of women would be muscular enough to render the wrong reading. 39% of participants had such little muscle mass on their body that their BMI would read normal while they still carried excess body fat. Another study in 2010 raised this percentage up to half, meaning that half of the normal weight category had too much body fat. This one really blows my mind. Our modern diet and lifestyle has left us so emaciated of muscle that an already crude measurement of body composition is wrong for all of the wrong reasons. So this one is sort of a lie because of the implication. However, it is true that BMI isn't a direct corollary to health and much, much more goes into our health than just one crude measurement. BMI, along with 
body fat, cardiovascular health, diet, lifestyle, and so on should all be considered as part of a holistic approach to human health. But the medical world has struggled to get over its BMI addiction. This weight obsession has gotten so bad, I've read stories of people with obesity complaining that when they go get their yearly flu shot, the attending nurse will start talking about their weight with them. Just completely unprompted. Which is awful and completely unacceptable. Weight shouldn't be this all-encompassing worry that obese people can't even go get something unrelated to their obesity without being badgered about their health. Obese people should feel empowered to discuss their health and their weight with their doctors. But the research on the effects of weight stigma and fat phobia, especially in the medical world, suggests that this isn't always the case. Here's something fat activists do get right. The effects of fat phobia have largely been ignored by the medical world. The psychological impact of discrimination can be incredibly debilitating, and not feeling valid in your body can cause not only health issues, but make it less likely for a person with obesity to lose weight. A potential driver for this obsession with weight is the media. Research shows that up to 98% of obesity-related media reports emphasize individual responsibility for weight. This individualization of blame goes hand in hand with the fat phobic portrayal of fat characters in movies and shows that promote negative stereotypes I'm sure you're very familiar with. This is far from a recent phenomenon. The genealogy of fat phobia, at least in the United States, can be traced back to white supremacist notions of black women. Arguably, fat phobia came before science clearly understood the health implications of obesity, in a racist attempt to elevate Victorian whiteness above black people. With all this in mind, people are right to be skeptical of the medical standard and its approach to obesity, especially since evidence shows that the current approach to obesity has been a spectacular failure. Long-term studies find that participants in weight loss interventions tend to regain any lost weight within two to five years. Despite assuaging a decades-long war against obesity, spending billions to combat it, obesity has only increased, and it's expected to envelop half of the USA by 2030. But what if I were to tell you that this was done on purpose? And that we believe these lies because of a deep, expansive conspiracy. But to hear about that, you're gonna have to catch me next week as I had to split this video into two parts to get something out by the end of the year. Happy New Year's, everybody. See you in 2022.